What do you think about Peter Moran? How do you say that? Peter Moran? Moran. And the Catholic Worker Movement. I heard that he uh, used... that's, that's pronounced Catholic Worker Movement. <laughs> I heard that he used to write something called the Easy Essays, if Charles could comment on that. Well, he did. He stopped when he died. Uh, no, Peter Morin was a brilliant man. Interesting, interesting character. He was a Frenchman. Uh, and in France, he drank deeply of the church's social teaching and of the work of people like uh, Albert de Mont and uh, René de la Tour du Pain. Um, he came to America, worked various menial jobs, and at a rally, a working man's rally, organized by the communists, he met a young reporter for Commonweal, a lady who's a convert herself, by the name of Dorothy Day. And their partnership resulted in the formation of the Catholic Worker Movement. Now, uh, Dorothy Day, she's not for canonization, but she was very much an activist. Peter Moran was the theorist of the movement. And he would sometimes embarrass her, although she, they all thought he was another saint, but he would sometimes embarrass her and the other Catholic workers because they tended to come from sort of a socialist left-wing background, which colored some of the things they would do and say and think. But Peter Morin was a French Catholic. And so we think of the Catholic worker as the left-wing movement, but Peter Morin thought of himself as right-wing. And uh, he said he wasn't in one of his easy essays, which are fun to read. You can get them online. Uh, he said that uh, he was a man of the right because he wanted to be right. Uh, he was not a man of the left because he didn't want to be left behind. You know, he, he would say things like that, which okay. really annoyed and frustrated people. But they're very clever. You know, he, uh, uh, they're, they're worth reading. Um, and in general, a lot of what the Catholic worker tried to do was very much in keeping with Bellick and, and uh, Chester and so on, and distributism and all the rest of it. Uh, they, they got into a fight with a lot of people during World War II because uh, they were not pacifists in the sense of saying that war is never moral. They did believe, however, and this is a fine distinction but an important one, they did believe that modern warfare had made just war, modern technology, had made just war, in the church's sense, impossible. You're, you are going to kill civilians by the score, hmm. or by the hundreds, or by the thousands. You're going to do all sorts of other things like that, which the church traditionally forbade, uh, and yet have become part and parcel. How of, do you feel about uh, that? How do I feel about it? Yeah, do you agree with them? Let's say I think they've got some really important points. Okay. I mean, I don't agree with them entirely, but I also don't think they're entirely wrong. Okay. Uh, and I think that, you know, a, a, a large part of our problem today is the fact that warfare has become so anonymous. You know, you just push a button and the enemy goes poof. Well, you tend to be a lot more careful about going to war if it's a bit more personal and intimate than that. Yeah. Now, mind you, uh, there are a lot of our, our dead and wounded soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan who will uh, show you that, yeah, war is still up close and personal for a lot yeah. of people. But they're not the ones directing the thing. Yeah. And and this is, this is the problem, you see, because the people who make the decisions are in some cases thousands of miles away from the scene of the battle and in no personal danger. Uh, now, mind you, there are techn technological reasons and all that for this, but uh, it's important to remember that the church's ideas of just war and that kind of thing uh, came about when kings still led their troops into battle mm, yeah, and would occasionally decide uh, a battle on the basis of personal combat. In other words, Army A, Army B, the king of this, this is the king of that. And for whatever reason, they suddenly get into their heads 
let's you and me fight. And that way they don't have to. I see. Now, you couldn't imagine modern leaders doing that. Of course. Yeah. Okay, anything else about Catholic worker movement? I didn't want to derail you well, too much. Yeah, the, the, the Catholic worker movement, um, I mean, it's, it's made up of very autonomous houses, each of whom were very different from one another. So I, of the ones I know, and I don't know that many of them, but the one I know, the ones I know best, I would say probably the Houston Catholic worker is the most in line with the original charism of the thing. Uh, we have a group of them in uh, Los Angeles, which I know somewhat. And actually, although I disagree with them on an awful lot of things, I definitely admire their work. And Jeff Dietrich, who's their head man many years ago, 20 years ago if it was a day, he told me something which I've never forgotten. I think it's very wise, and I will share it with him. And it's certainly very indicative of the Catholic worker. Now, he and his wife have run a soup kitchen in downtown LA since 1967. 53 years. And, of course, in all that time, things have not gotten better in the Poverty Rose section of LA. If anything, they're worse. Yet every day, the Catholic workers are out there slopping soup for the poor. Now, I asked him why, after all that time, he hadn't burned out. And he told me something I thought was very wise, and I will share it with you now. Uh, he said that uh, if you do this kind of thing expecting to make a difference, you'll burn out. You do it because it's what God has made you to do. You do it because you have to do it, like breathing. Mm. And then you never burn out. And I, I could see that. I should also say that Dorothy Day was a friend of uh, my former confessor, the late James Francis Cardinal McIntyre. And he uh, said to me about her that he really enjoyed her company and she drove him crazy. And he could never quite tell if she was crazy or she was a saint. Well, that reminds me of my one of my favorite sayings. Ah, uh -huh. takes a saint to live with a saint. Well, there's that. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I always wonder about that. Like, would Saint Francis? Actually, I read because uh, I've been reading so many Saint Francis biographies that Saint Francis was not chill with Saint Dominic. They had no. conflicting, <laughs> you know. They're, they were friends, but they had issues. Yeah, yeah. And stuff like that. It's, and obviously, well, everyone it's, knows St. Augustine and St. Jerome. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure. They yeah, were friends. Yeah. But there was a creative tension between them. <laughs> you know. Yeah. St. Wilfred of York and St. Bernard of Clairvaux couldn't stand each other. Isn't that funny, though? Because these people are flooded with grace. They have so much charity and the humility, but this other saint just can't handle this other saint, man. <laughs> yeah, he's it's, it's too annoying. Well, don't forget they weren't saints then. When they were alive. Uh, yeah, well, that's true. They weren't and saints then. And it's, it's important to bear in mind that your sanctity all depends on the state of mind you're in when you die. But nevertheless, based on their acts... They're flooded with graces. They have special graces that yeah. we don't get, us normal folk. Which uh, shows you that being normal isn't everything it's cracked up to be. <laughs> this is why I've been able to successfully avoid it my entire career. <laughs>